So we started this new series called What, Why, How series. And last week we were looking uh, at that central thing of why Jesus, you know, the whole point of church, the whole point we gather, uh, the whole center of our faith as Christians is this person of Jesus and who he was, what he came to do. And then today, as that sort of video introduced, our focus is on uh, what is worship. Um, and then in the weeks coming up, we're going to look at some of the more practical things of, you know, why and how do we come to church? What is prayer? What's that about? Why and how do we read the Bible? Uh, and we've got some guest speakers. We've got Trina speaking next week, and then we've got a guest preacher, uh, James Halstead from the Diocese, coming in a few weeks' time uh, as well, which is really good. Um, but today we're looking at what is worship, this theme. And before we get into that, Isabel is going to bring our reading to us um, from Matthew's Gospel. So do you want to just come to the front here? I'll give you a mic. No, no, that's great. You want to stand here for a second. Well, so this is our reading from Matthew uh, 6 today. Should hopefully come on the screens, yeah. Yes, yeah, today's reading is from Matthew 6, verses 19 to 26, um, and then from uh, 31 to 33. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what will you wear? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns. And let your heavenly Father feed them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you will need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Well, thank you, Isabel. Great. So I wonder uh, then, what is uh, worship is our theme today. I wonder what comes to mind for you uh, when you hear that word worship. Um, one uh, dictionary definition, uh, and perhaps you think along similar lines, says uh, worship is the feeling or the expression of reverence or adoration for a deity. And that's a grand uh, definition of what worship might be. Or perhaps it makes you think of what we do on a Sunday or you get images of candles and cathedrals and choirs uh, going around your mind. Or perhaps it makes you think of a style of music. There's a whole new genre of uh, music these days, uh, Christian uh, worship music. Lots of good stuff in there as well. But perhaps what, that's what comes to mind uh, for you when you think of worship. But, you know, worship is much, actually much more broad than all of these things. The word worship actually comes from an old English word, worth Skype. Um, it was the old uh, English word. Um, and it means really to give someone or something worth, to place someone or something in that place of ultimate importance. Well, today, who might say, well, I, I don't worship. You know, I'm not religious. I'm not into that kind of thing. But, you know, the strong Christian conviction uh, through the ages, really, is that we are all, in fact, religious. We are all worshipping beings because we've all been made by a God who's called us to come and to worship him. That's how God has made us. Each, each of us has been made to know and to worship God, to give worth to God and find our life's purpose and meaning and joy in relation, first and foremost, to him. 
But you know, if we don't worship God, if we don't give him that worth, um, then it doesn't mean that we don't worship. It just means that we'll worship something else instead. And you know, this uh, view is widespread. It's not just uh, limited to Christian thinkers or an understanding, a Christian understanding of the world. The uh, post-modern novelist David Foster Wallace once said, In daily life, there's no such thing as not worshipping. Wherever you tap real meaning in life, whether it's having money, being beautiful, being thought smart, promoting some good cause, everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. You know, right near the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, Moses is given the Ten Commandments, the sort of founding documents um, of the people of God. And it says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's the first of the commandments uh, that God uh, gives to his people uh, in, uh, in those commandments. And, you know, these ten commands had been given to God's people not to hinder them or to harm them, but to help them to live well in life, to help them to make good choices and to live within God's good order for creation. And right there at the top of the list, God says to them, have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to them or worship them. And, you know, given the culture of the day, you know, where idols were everywhere, where each nation had its own uh, deity or gods or several, you know, we can perhaps understand why that was potentially an issue you know, idolatry was rife. We've got some pictures here. Uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's an image of Baal there uh, and someone coming to pay homage uh, to the ancient god Baal. Uh, but, you know, bowing before man-made idols or statues was the cultural norm in those days. And as we read the Old Testament time and time again, we see the people of God failing to keep up to this commandment, failing to just worship Yahweh alone, the God of Israel, and always going bowing down before these other gods of the nations around them. And, you know, in the Roman world, too, and that's where we get the second image. Oh, sorry, Alex, back to that one before. Um, This is the temple of Artemis. You know, the Roman world, too, the world which uh, Jesus lived and walked in uh, and, 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 and went around in. It was much the same. It was a polytheistic society. There was many gods, many idols that could be worshipped, each uh, with their own powers, each with their own temple, each with their own cultic practices uh, that you uh, used uh, and followed. And it's easy for us to think, uh, you know, how, how it could have been important for these Israelites, uh, it, for them to have a, a, a commandment like that, you know, because idolatry was clearly a problem then. Uh, idols uh, of the day were obvious around them. But, you know, perhaps, uh, though they're more perhaps subtle in our day, our idols are actually no less real. You know, the gods of wealth, of sex, of acclaim, of beauty still clamor for our attention now as they did then. Though we may not physically bow down to them and worship them like the idols of uh, Aphrodite or Artemis, we can still offer them worship we can still look to them for our ultimate fulfillment and joy in life. Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer um, of the 16th century, I think, was it? I don't know. Um, He said this, whatever your heart clings to uh, and confides in, that is really your God. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. And Jesus, in that reading from Matthew's gospel, uh, says a similar thing. It's up on the screens. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you put first in life, in other words, whatever has captivated you, has your heart, has your worship, and therefore, ultimately, has your allegiance. In in our reading from uh, Matthew's gospel, it's the idol of money that Jesus draws our attention to, isn't it? No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And you notice that money there has got a capital M because the word in, that Jesus uses is mammon, which is, you know, the God of riches of the day. And this is a, um, a painting from 1909, I think, from Evelyn de Morgan, who sort of pictures that worship 
uh, of mammon, um, the god of riches. And you know, money and riches has always and always will be a big idol in our world, isn't it? Won't it? You know, just that sense of just wanting that little bit more and then I'll be satisfied, then I'll be happy. Going after the wealth and the riches that we think that, that will buy us happiness. But really, anything can become an idol to us if we're not careful. You know, our careers, our health, our image, our things, our families even, good things even, can become idols to us when they become uh, God things. There's a writer called uh, Tim Keller who's written this book called Counterfeit Gods. And he says this, um, if we think about what is an idol, he says, it is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. And you know, when we stop to notice it, we see that there's still in our modern world so much that absorbs our hearts and imaginations. So many things that can become more important to us than God. You now think of the shopping malls or the car boot sales perhaps where millions go each Sunday to worship, to find fulfillment and worth perhaps. You know, one writer uh, said this, you know, the local mall is actually one of the most religious sites in town. Not because it's preaching a message or touting a doctrine, but because it's after your heart. You know, it pays them to suck you in, doesn't it? And get your heart and get your attention and get your allegiance. Think too of the football stadiums. You know, we've seen some scenes of the fans' jubilant return uh, to the football stadiums recently. And um, understandably, the sort of uh, jubilation at finally being back in the stands. But, you know, I've been struck in recent weeks just seeing some of the scenes and seeing actually turning to tree and go, this is worship. They're, they're, they're worshipping, really. And to be honest, if I was at Old Trafford yesterday, yesterday with CR7's return, I probably would have been worshipping a little bit too. But anyway, we won't go into that. But, you know... Another uh, one observer puts it like this. I quite like it. Um, the stadiums have become like cathedrals. The players like the priests. The goals like the offerings. And this is the best bit. The referees, the church wardens in attendance. <laughs> <laughs> you can listen to the recording. You can hear it. But, yeah, you know, now don't mishear me at all. You know, there's nothing wrong, of course, with working hard at our careers. There's nothing wrong with going to see a bit of football, getting nice things, loving our kids and our families around us. But, you know, it's how we relate to it all that matters. Are we enjoying them as God's good gifts to us? Or are we deriving our sense of worth and meaning and purpose from them? Are we clinging to these things and confiding in them, as that Martin Luther quote talked about? for our fulfillment and our joy, and therefore putting them in the place of God in our lives. You know, whatever you attribute ultimate worth to is what you worship. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in is really your God. That, that question on there, there is nothing in the world more important to me than dot, dot, dot. You know, how we answer that question will tell us a lot about who it is or what it is we really worship. God says, have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to man-made things. But you know, why does God command that? You know, why does God teach us that? Well, really, it's for our own good. It's because he knows what's right and good for us. You know, misplaced worship is actually bad for us. It gets us out of sync with our creation and our creator. Idolatry actually distorts the good things in life. You know, God made us for us, for himself, to worship him alone. And he's the only one who can actually carry the weight of our worship. You know, when we place that worship on other things, it becomes dangerous. It can all come toppling down. Idolatry can even start to distort the good things in life. It puts too much pressure on them. Think of family life, for instance. You know, family life can be wonderful. It would be a great blessing. But if family becomes an idol to us, the thing that defines us, the thing that we look to for ultimate fulfillment and joy, then it will buckle in the end. You know, our relationships can become strained, our hopes dashed when things perhaps don't turn out as we imagined they might. You know, people might say, I thought having kids would make me happy, would fill that hole. And you know, it might satisfy us in some ways, but it can't satisfy that deep yearning of our hearts that only God can satisfy. Idols can never satisfy. They will always let us down. They have no power in the end to save. 
Uh, Alexander the Great famously, you know, after giving his life to building his kingdom, acquiring great wealth and uh, having great success, was troubled on his deathbed that he could take none of it with him. And reportedly he asked, he ordered his servants to leave his hands out of his coffin uh, so that as they marched him along, people could see that as he came into the world empty-handed, so too uh, was he leaving the world empty-handed. And you know, that's echoed in uh, when Paul talks to Timothy in uh, the letter of Timothy, where Paul says, you brought nothing into the world and you can take nothing away. And that's true, isn't it? At least in a material sense, nothing we build up here on earth can be taken uh, with us. You know, that passage from Exodus uh, that we looked at, that great first commandment, um, God begins it with those words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the one, in other words, who can really save you. I'm the one who's got a track record of setting you free. Therefore, don't look at these other things. Look to me. You know, worldly wealth, success, acclaim can never fully save or never fully satisfy. But I can, God says. You know, God knows that misplaced worship is bad for us, that idols will never satisfy. And he knows, too, that our worship shapes us and trains us. You know, what we give our hearts to begins also to shape our hearts as well. And that's why worshiping rightly is really important. You know, we become like the idols we worship, for better or for worse. And this comes right into the everyday Uh, There's a writer called uh, James K.A. Smith, who he observes that we don't just do things, but they do things to us. We don't just do things, but the things we do uh, do things to us as well. The routines and rhythms of our everyday lives are really routines, uh, are really rituals which are shaping our hearts, are shaping our desires, and in the end, will end up shaping our whole direction in life. That's why we need to be careful of how we live, of what we give and our our time and our attention to, what we make the focus and goal of our lives. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you desire most, whatever you give your time and attention and imaginations to, will bit by bit take over your heart until perhaps there's no place left for God. We don't just do things, but those things we do, do things to us as well. You know, that's why what we do when we gather uh, together in worship is so important. That's why making times during our busy weeks to spend time in God's presence, to pray, to read our Bibles, to get a good worship playlist uh, on the go, perhaps, is so crucial. Because in those times, it's like we recalibrate our hearts to God. It's like we recenter our lives on Jesus again. We come back to our true north the way we should be pointing. You know, those regular practices of singing, of reading, of reflecting on Jesus, of reaffirming our faith, of reading God's word, reminds us who we are and whose we are as well. It realigns us with Jesus again. It refocuses our hearts and our worship away from other things and back onto him alone, reminding us to put him above all else, reminding us that it's in him that our ultimate fulfillment and joy uh, is to be found. And our reading today ended uh, with Jesus saying those amazing words, didn't it? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will come to. You know, what Jesus is saying is, put me first in your hearts. Make me your first priority, the center of your praise and everything else will come into place. It's not that these other things are unimportant. Of course they are. Food, clothes, work, health, uh, family. Of course we need those things. They're good things for us to enjoy. But put me first in your heart, and all these things will come into line. God's good and right order will be restored, and you can truly, truly live and flourish now, our worship of Jesus then realigns, re- realigns us, re-centers us. And it also amazingly reconnects us to it, enables that encounter uh, with the living God. There's a great uh, verse in the Psalms uh, which says, God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits the praises of his people. 
And we'll speak about this a little bit more in the coming weeks when we look at prayer, when we look at uh, why and how do we come to church. But, you know, there's something powerful about us worshipping together and, and about uh, us worshipping God. You know, God is at work in these times. He inhabits our praises. As we draw near to him in worship, so he draws near to us by his spirit, speaking into our hearts, strengthening our spirits. We can come to worship then, expecting to meet with Jesus, to have good coffee, yeah, hopefully, to our kids to have a good time, but also to meet uh, with Jesus as well. Our worship then recenters us on God. It reconnects us with Jesus. And finally, it refuels us then to go out into the world and to live the whole of our lives for him. You know, we're called, of course, not just to worship God with our words, but with the whole of our lives, to live lives that are all about bringing him praise. There's a verse uh, where Paul says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. You know, that is our aim uh, as those that follow Jesus, to do everything for the glory of God. Uh, I'll finish with this, but there's a vicar at our last church in Woolerton, Trevor, who is a great uh, guy, and he often used to finish services with the words, the service has ended, now let the worship begin. It's quite a nice phrase, isn't it? The service has ended, now let the worship begin. You know, that is what we go out to, to worship God, not just here, not just with our tongues, but with our lives and every day.